Good evening and welcome to Metro Focus. I'm Jack Ford. There are many important political races going on this year, but no race is more important to New Yorkers than the race for governor. Governor Andrew Cuomo certainly expects to keep his position, but the numbers from a recent Quinnipiac poll show that it might not be that easy a run. Apparently, the governor's not making everyone happy. It's not a surprise. And now, challengers are beginning to circle. Among those with the ability to take on the incumbent is the Republican New York State Senator, who, by the way, has never been defeated in a political race, Deputy Majority Leader of the Senate John DeFrancisco. But before he has words with Governor Cuomo, He's going to need to win his own party's nomination. And he joins us now to discuss the race, what's at stake, and what this election means for New Yorkers. Senator, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. Let me start off with the, the question that I ask all candidates for all of, of the positions here in New York State and New York City. And that is, why do you want to become the governor of the state of New York? Well, you know, people are leaving the state of New York in record numbers, and, uh, and we're leading the, every state in people leaving the state. And to me, that means people are voting with their feet. Uh, you can't afford New York State anymore with the highest tax. There was a report that came out a couple of days ago. Uh, there's the greatest regulations. Businesses keep getting more and more regulations uh, heaped on them, and they can't make a living, and they can't hire people. So we need a fundamental change. And as a senator, I've I've been in, in government for quite some time and uh, local government before that. Uh, it's tough working around the edges, uh, trying to make fundamental change. We make some, some changes uh, each year uh, for the better, some not so good. But the fact of the matter, the only way that you're going to make fundamental change is to uh, have the position of governor. That governor sets the agenda and has the ability to make that agenda happen. You have an, make an interesting point I wanted to ask you about. It is, you know, our democratic, democratic process is fairly complicated. We have checks and balance built in intentionally to the system. And the question that always comes up, especially when we're talking about races such as this, just exactly how powerful do you think the governor of the state of New York is? Certainly you can set out, this is my agenda, this is what I want to do. But do they have the capacity, without both sides being on, or, or, or both houses being on their side, do they have the ability to actually get that done? Oh, absolutely. And I think uh, uh, what happens is New York State uh, gives a, a substantial, almost all the power over the budget process to the governor. And uh, the governor can uh, uh, veto changes in the budget that the Senate or the Assembly wants. Uh, and then you're always under the deadline of an April 1 deadline and shutting down government. So in his budget, he always puts in not only budget issues and what, how we're going to pay for whatever services we have, but also other issues that have nothing to do with the budget at all. Uh, this year, there's a, a bill in there, the, in the budget bill uh, for DREAMers, in other words, paying college tuition for people who are illegally in the country. There's a provi provision in there concerning uh, late-term abortions, allowing, uh, allowing that to occur, and abortion, abortion expansion in the state of New York. All kinds of political, not necessarily political, but social issues that really have nothing to do with uh, the uh, dollars and cents of running a government, which you think the budget was about. So having that ability and uh, in all those respects, uh, he has substantial uh, control over the budget. So as you know, political races are, are about, among other things, differentiating yourself from others. Yeah. So if, if indeed you were to become the governor, Tell us what Governor DeFrancisco would say are his most important priority issues. Well, definitely the budget and, again, the, the economy in the state of New York. What I think, and I've been arguing for this for years, but I've been un unable to make it happen, uh, is that you can't just provide an economic development policy that awards people hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases to come into the state, and the governor picks and chooses who that is. And that has actually ended up with uh, a lot of winners, uh, many losers, and the winners are picked by the governor. And if you look at the corruption trial going on in New York, uh, New York City right now, it's obvious that uh, the governor had a pay-to-play operation going on in, in the governor's office. So that's not the way to do economic development. The best way to do economic development is cross the board tax cuts, cross the board uh, regulation reforms that make business 
it made New York State not the last in business friendliness, but a better business atmosphere for people to come here and create jobs. So that would be part of it. And in order to make that happen, in order to have the funding to do what you have to do, you've got to reform the uh, whole system. It's not just tinkering at the edges. Education, we spend more than any other state. Medicaid, we spend more than the states of Florida and uh, uh, Texas combined. One third of the people are on Medicaid. You can't afford that system. And when you have a system like that, that that's costly, the governor in, in a time when we have a deficit situation, he's calling for more what he calls revenue enhancers, a billion dollars, more taxes and, and fees. It just makes it less and less desirable to be in the state of New York and less affordable. That's got to change and go in the exact opposite direction. You mentioned the, the Medicaid numbers, and I suspect um, if you were having a conversation, if this was a debate going on, that the governor would say to you, so what is going to happen to all of those people? That's a safety net for them. It provides health care for a certain category of folks. Are you suggesting that we, we limit it in some fashion, do away with it in some fashion? How would you deal with that? Well, the states of Texas and Florida and other states do it a lot less expensively than we do. And our problem is one third of our citizens are on Medicaid, one third. It's supposed to be a safety net, as you just imagined, as you just said, uh, it's, it's not a safety net anymore. One third, we, we gotta provide for the poor, and the infirm and those that need the, those services the most. And secondly, uh, so we have to look at the eligibility standards. Secondly, uh, there's optional services that states are not required to provide. And uh, New York State allows for every optional service that this federal government talks about, which means greater expenses. So you can't afford the Cadillac of systems when you are a state that is losing people, losing taxpayers, and uh, eventually, Someone's going to turn out the lights, the last one leaving, and there's not going to be the funding, the tax base for people who need Medicaid and people who surely should get that safety net uh, uh, because the, the revenues won't be there to, to uh, provide the services, the base, even the basic services that they need. As you know, the, the, the country has been shocked uh, by most recently the school shooting in Parkland, Florida. And as a consequence, it, it has moved questions about gun safety and, and how we protect our young people in schools to the forefront of our conversation. So let me ask you this then, what is your position as you look at what's happened, and we'll use Parkland as, as the illustration if you would, um, looking at that, and if someone said to you, all right, now Senator, if you were to be governor, DeFrancisco, what could you do then, what would you do to help protect our students in our schools? Well, first of all, you've got to stop the noise in the in the debate. You've got to have a realistic discussion about solutions. The minute there's a gun violence somewhere, then there's the group calling for banning of different guns, banning of weapons. And then you hear the other side saying we have a constitutional right. So the, the people on the each side of the issue are so firm in, in, in deciding that there's nothing that's in common. I disagree. For example, we've put in a TSA network because we had terrorism uh, to, in order to make sure that people are safe on the planes. What, who should we protect more than, than young students? Uh, we've got a bill in the Senate that I'm a co-sponsor of that would provide for a retired police officer to be a resource officer in the, in the schools, uh, teach children what to do in, in those situations, but be there as some defense. Right now, the children are defenseless. Nobody has any kind of way to defend them until someone shows up uh, minutes or maybe even uh, hours later uh, after the fact. So that's one thing. Uh, and it's going to cost, well, priorities. You got to pay for what's most important. Secondly, you got to make sure that those people who are mentally ill or have tendencies that have been come up, that have come out, not to be able to get guns. I mean, that is, is clearly a, uh, another thing. And lastly, I, well, there's more than lastly, but the other point that I would suggest is this. When I go online and buy a shirt for the next two months, I seem to get shirt advertisements. So if the commercial uh, world can find out that I'm interested in shirts, you mean to tell me there's no uh, uh, technology that can see things that people are doing that are bad and see things that are uh, uh, indicative of maybe some violence in the future and get that information to the authorities who have to act on it. And we've got to do those types of things. Some will say that's profiling. So be it. 
you know, we're trying to protect people. And if there's bizarre behaviors, the police and the law enforcement authorities should know about it. So you've talked about uh, providing protection in the schools, and we've heard a lot of people on both sides agreeing on that. You've talked about the notion of enhancing our background checks so that we can d d delve deeper into the notion of mental illnesses. And again, there seems to be some coalescence there. What about the idea of certain types of weapons just not being available to the public? Specifically, we talk about these semi-automatic weapons, often referred to as assault types of weapons. What would your position be on that? Well, first of all, uh, automatic weapons have been outlawed forever, the number one. Number two is we have the strictest gun laws in the, in the country, in the state of New York. And uh, each time, and I've been there, each time when uh, gun laws become more and more restrictive, you look at the most ugly looking gun, and uh, as, as a result, those are the ones we're gonna ban. That doesn't stop someone from getting any other type of weapon and cause violence. Uh, in our state, for example, we the governor limited the number of uh, uh, bullets that would be in a, in a magazine, uh, as if to say someone who, who's intent on violence is only going to uh, worry about a misdemeanor of having too many bullets in a magazine and won't uh, use something that's illegal. So I, it's, it's been tried. These things keep happening. And uh, it just seems to me the more logical approach is to keep those people that are dangerous not getting weapons. In, in improving the ability to find those people out and uh, making sure that uh, the, those warning signs are not uh, violated. So uh, it, it depends. If there's another weapon that looks ugly and uh, may do some violence and we ban that in the state of New York or elsewhere, I'm not so sure that's going to be the solution. Well, Senator, we appreciate you spending some time with us. I, our hope is that this is the first in a series of conversations we can have with you as we are going to conduct with all of the other candidates. And, and so we'll look forward to getting you back and, and continuing this conversation. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. And thank you for having me. All right, you be well.